Firstly, uh, I would wish to share my deepest condolences to the families who lost their loved ones yesterday in Kashmir. Uh, a lot of people tell me that what has happened to Kashmir, Kashmir has no, now more, more or less become like a high altitude graveyard where you see deaths and destruction happening almost every day. Uh, it's about 7 million people waiting for their turns to die. Uh, you have killings of one sort, killings of one nature one day, and another day you have killings of another nature. It becomes hard for us to at times decide what to condemn and what not to condemn. The moral dilemmas that a normal Kashmiri goes through, when it comes to what kind of violence to at times condone and what type, what type of violence to at times condemn. Should all violence be condemned? What kind of violence is defensive violence? These are certain questions which only a normal Kashmiri or an average Kashmiri can understand. And somebody who <coughs> believes in non violence and believes that human lives matter and all lives matter, it really hurts to see such death and destruction happening in Kashmir. When Seema initially talked to me about this event, we thought of Name, name get futures for Kashmir, what kind of futures are we looking at? Uh, there's this famous post-modernist, post-colonialist, Ziyamdin Sardar, and he talks about three kinds of futures that when we talk about future of a place, we are basically talking about a series of tomorrows. One future is future as extended present. If there was somebody who was looking at Kashmir in the year 2000, and he was looking at the death and destruction that was happening. And then he would think that maybe it is kind of a policy intransigence that we have seen. Then he could safely possibly predict that 20 years down the line, the kind of future that we are going to have, that's going to be a tad close to the present that we have. And today, when you look at the death and destruction happening in Kashmir, if we somehow had to have to make a prediction about the next 20 years, one could safely argue that if the policy intransigence and the reluctance of the states to take care of the violence and the situation continues, then 20 years down the line, we could be dealing with an extended present where violence is on the peak, the tensions are escalating, there is no political process happening, the, the polarities which have been there, those polarities are widening, and the space for democratic and uh, descent that's that's shrinking. Another is a familiar future. A familiar, familiar future would be that a future maybe beyond 15 to 20 years, which we can possibly think of, but we cannot talk about with certainty because we do not understand those events which may be actually happening 10 to 15 years down the line. And then third would be an unknown future, a future which is very hard for us to imagine. So when you look at this kind of formulation. What kind of futures are we looking at today when it, when it comes to Kashmir? Year 2018 was one of the deadliest years. In 2001, we saw the highest number of casualties in Kashmir. And a decade down, in 2018, the number of casualties on the both sides of the ideological divide, that went and skyrocketed. We have yesterday seen one of the deadliest attacks in Kashmir in the last 30 years. We have seen absolutely no chances for any sorts of reconciliation happening whereby Kashmiri pundits would come back home. We have seen a new kind of educated militancy emerging in Kashmir where PhD scholars are taken to arms. We have seen an absolute sense of estrangement of a young generation of Kashmiris from the democratic process. In 2018, when panchayat and, and local body elections were held, we saw a near total boycott of the electoral process. So we are seeing a decline at multiple levels. And if this decline continues that, that the way it is, we are going to be dealing with an extended present, a crisis of a similar nature or maybe a crisis far bigger in magnitude 10 years down the line. One more thing. When it comes to the external dimension of the conflict, we are also seeing the churning that is happening in Afghanistan this time. 
what kind of psychological impact it has on the groups which are engaged in violent conflict that needs to be understood. We also need to understand the dynamics in South Asia in view of the Chinese interest in the region. We need to understand how is the future going to be like if this happens, if things continue to happen the way things are happening. In Kashmir, three or four things are very important which will be happening in the next 20 years where the nuance needs to be picked up and we need to understand the challenge that's going to emerge. When it comes to the political processes, we have had hundreds of rounds of dialogue in the last 70 years. But you know what is going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years is that the kind of leadership which is in Kashmir this time, the leadership which has been ready to engage, the leadership which has a history of engagement with the Indian state, that leadership is turning over. That leadership is on the way out. You are going to have a new set of leaders in Kashmir who have absolutely no idea of normalcy, who have been brought up during the years of war. What kind of engagement are we going to expect with that leadership? That's going to be a challenge in itself, number one. Number second, we are seeing escalation in violence. Now what happens? When a youngster gets killed, an educated youngster gets killed in a Kashmiri village, that entire village is lost. There is absolutely no way you can communicate with that village through a democratic process. That village is lost. <coughs> when a soldier dies and the coffin goes to some other places in the rest of the country, that village is lost. We are losing villages by villages and districts by districts every day. The more killings happen, the more it will be impossible for us to bring these villages together and the polarization of the narratives across the country is going to happen. That's going to be a second extreme danger when it comes to the impact of violence on the societies in the near future. Third important thing, what we have seen in the last four to five years is that we have seen extinguishing of certain spaces of solidarity in the Indian civil society when it comes to dealing with Kashmir. You may all recall, and it kind of feels like nostalgia today, that four to five years down the line, four to five years back, we used to have conversations about Kashmir on Indian TV. Those conversations, conversations used to be very decent. Those conversations used to be full of sympathy and empathy for people of Kashmir. Those conversations used to acknowledge the political crisis in Kashmir. What has happened to those conversations? Somewhere in the din of last four to five years now, we have lost those conversations. And the more those spaces get ext extinguished in the Indian liberal class, the more difficult it's going to be tomorrow to continue to have a dialogue and a meaningful dialogue with the people of Kashmir. Fourth important thing that's, that has happened, and that is a very dangerous thing to happen, is that Kashmir has always been a poll-related issue. It has been an electoral issue. But in recent times, the toxic narrative in the country has gone to such a level where killings in Kashmir fuel a certain sort of hatred in the rest of the country. It has become a very easy way of winning elections. And that has led to a dehumanization at both levels, both within Kashmir and outside. Killings have become just a kind of statistic. They have become some sort of a fodder, cannon fodder for the poll machine to move on. I think these are four important dangers which we need to be awake to when, 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 when we think about the crisis in Kashmir today. What's the way forward finally? I think the, the, some, some people tell me that why are we talking about the old issues and the old hackneyed arguments today? The dialogue and the conversations and, and communication and talks and all that. I said, what are the other alternatives? We have tried surgical strikes. Have they worked? They haven't. Can we afford a new war? with our nuclear neighbor, it depends on the Indian state if it can, my belief is that we can't. Can we afford one more escalation in South Asia? I think we cannot. Can we afford military solutions? We have seen the military solutions. We have seen what is happening in Kashmir today. You have an entire population of youngsters which is ready to pick up guns if you give them guns. Military solution is not a solution for Kashmir. I have been reiterating it time and again. And when it comes to my resignation also, I think that was also a point that there is a crisis in Kashmir. 
I have been trying to bring to the spotlight this crisis which we saw yesterday. And this is something which we should be awakened to that yesterday we crossed the Rubicon. Yesterday was a watershed moment in the conflict of Kashmir. Something which has never happened before. And if this happens again, believe me, believe me friends, you will have an Afghanistan in the north, the north of India, which is already there, but it will be within it. You will have a Syria. It's a Vietnam in the making, and we cannot absolutely afford it. Now, what, is, what are some of the very simple things which can be done possibly, possibly when it comes to de-escalating and, and, and overcoming this type of violence? Would be one, as my aunt said, it's about enlarging the democratic space. Kashmiri today, when you talk to him about democracy, he reminds you about 1953. He tells you what was 1953. You have an elected prime minister of the state, and he was sent to jail and put behind the bars for 22 years. What happened in 1987? When I talk to young Kashmiris today, I tell them that we need to engage democratically. They tell me what about 1987? What was that? Are you going to guarantee us that the electoral processes will not be rigged? That there is a certain kind of legitimacy in the democratic engagement? These are very tough questions. If we are really ready to enlarge the democratic space in Kashmir and experiment with true democracy, as ma'am said, I think that's going to be one of the most phenomenal remedies to the current, current state of crisis. You can, you can blame people for not engaging democratically when you first give them the democratic option. Today, violence begets violence, and the state reacts with violence, and the people react with more violence. When I ask people to abandon their guns, they tell me, come on, let's state abandon its gun first. Let's stay, put forward its democratic feed first, then we are going to kind of step back and actual violence. So democratic spaces will be very important. Second, when it comes to dealing with Kashmir, I think India needs to, Indian democracy needs to be very large-hearted. Kashmir is not an ordinary place, it's not an ordinary state. We are already in a very special and a unique arrangement with the Union of India. When it comes to interpreting ideas of dissent, ideas of, uh, ideas of uh, defection, ideas of uh, uh, sedition, ideas of freedom of speech, I think we'll have to be more large-hearted when it comes to dealing with them. Today, what happens is that when a Kashmiri comes out of Kashmir, you know what he turns into? He, the, the first source of alienation is when he comes to Delhi, comes to Bangalore. He becomes first-time conscious that this place is not his place. When he comes to look for, a, look for an apartment here in, here in Delhi, he is made to believe that this is not the place that belongs to you. He goes back. He finds all doors closed. He finds pushed to the wall. What happens when you when you when you create a, when you create an environment of constriction, an environment of suffocation? It reflects itself in the it manifests itself in the escalation of violence. It may sound to be a very stupid way of dealing with it because we are very used to kind of passing on the blame to our neighboring countries. And we say that it's the neighboring country which does it. But finally, we have to also look at the supply and the demand side of violence. When there is no supply and demand there in the state, you will not have other people coming in and interfering with your sovereign kind of space. So democratic space and logic will be very important. Second is, I wish we could revive that intellectual solidarity which is in the rest of the country. The Indian intellectual class needs to speak more of when it comes to the crisis in Kashmir. I know there has been an absolute environment of siege when it comes to the rest of the country in the last four to five years. I wish the intellectual class rises up and actually acknowledges those humanitarian realities when it comes to Kashmir. Kashmir is today bleeding on both sides. Nobody is happy when a soldier dies, when a young man dies there, it's the humanity which suffers. I think the civil society and the intellectual class needs to revive those old bonds of friendship with Kashmir. That's really going to help us. Third thing, when it comes to Indian media, I'm really sorry, I've been talking about it time and again. Indian media is not going to help anybody here. I mean, those certain, there is nothing like Indian media, a lot of people tell me there's nothing like national media. You have certain channels which are, which are dishing out that poisonous narrative, which is like really putting fire onto the flame and putting fuel onto the flame. I wish the media channels realize that what kind of deserves their will to this democracy. I really will, would not be making any bones in accepting that Indian media and the national media is by and large responsible for 
these deaths that are happening in Kashmir today. A lot of blood is definitely on those hands, which are on those blue and red and green and all those newsrooms. I think the rest of the questions we can possibly be taking to the question and answer session. I was not actually in a proper state of mind today to be talking to you, to be very honest. I had requested Seema that maybe we could kind of postpone this conversation to some other time. But then these conversations are really important. I believe that maybe in, even in these times of crisis, even in these times of despair, it's good that we keep on talking to each other and keep on sharing those solidarities and keep on kind of giving support to each other. I thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. so many young people here, it really shows that there's a deep desire to understand the roots of the problem. And I would suggest just one very simple thing. Before you ask questions about the conflict, we should do well to figure out why do people pick up the gun in a democracy when they have the right to elect and dismiss representatives? Why is it maybe violence is politics of the last resort. We have to figure this out. But the asking of questions is what makes a society alive. This is what makes for solidarity. You know, solidarity is a concept that has been not used in political debate of, of uh, the present or even of the recent past. But my generation was brought up in this, you know, with, with notions of solidarity that if somebody is killed, it hurts you because they are a fellow citizen, he or she is a fellow citizen. And your uh, short introduction to, and what you feel deeply, obviously Isha Faisal feels very deeply about the issue, reminded me of a poem which again we grow up with. The death of each man diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind, so ask not for whom the bell tolls. It tools for you and me. May I now ask Mr. Murad to no, after Murad I think today is a day when we might think. I think we could talk about framing it as democracy. Dira did it. And Shah Fazl has really given us an account of what is happening in Kashmir. What is it that the Kashmiri today lives through? And what are the political spaces that exist over there? I would like to focus on that how Kashmir has become a part of the larger narrative of framing Indian nationalism in a certain way. <clears throat> and I'll start with this, that we are not talking of nation as a nation of people, but we are talking of the land. We are talking of Kashmir, not about Kashmiris. And I think that's the fundamental difference of this kind of nation that is being talked about. I remember when the nuclear bombs were exploded, exploded at that time, <coughs> and even later, there have been social media messages going around which says even if there three-fourths of the Indian people get killed in a nuclear war, it's okay because we'll be victorious and it does not matter if we lay down our lives for this land, the radioactive land. Now, this is again that nationalism will speak framed in terms of blood and land not in terms of the people. And I think this is the fundamental issue. Is the nationalism for the people or is it for an idea of a so-called land which is, belongs to a certain set of people, which excludes a certain set of people and exclusionary nationalism built on what used to be called blood and race nationalism. And I think that's the challenge which makes Kashmir the poem of this narrative. That Kashmir, what is happening today, is not because there is any desire or belief that this will solve the problem of Kashmir. 
it is to rouse a certain kind of exclusionary nationalism which can then be used be, to knit a certain narrative together which is what we are seeing today. And I think it's necessary for us to confront that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhupada. Okay, guys, we'll keep the applause for later. Uh, I totally agree that the kind of exclusionary nationalism which has been uh, in vogue in the country for the last four or five years. Uh, if you look at the, the graph of violence, it may sound very coincidental, but the fact is that the escalation in the violence has happened in the last five years, fundamentally. And you could blame it on coming together of two political, political ideologies of opposed polarities. You could also blame it on the kind of muscular and the militarized narrative which, uh, which, which became popular in the rest of the country. And I have absolutely no doubts that whatever has happened in the last five years in Kashmir, uh, it definitely, the, the sh definitely those people have to share the blame who have been trying to promote a certain brand of nationalism in the country. And those echoes, those uh, that that echo definitely is in Sri Lanka at this time. What has been happening in the rest of the country? The lynch mob nationalism, the TV TV room nationalism, the ink uh, and the scholar nationalism, the nationalism of uh, denying uh, the political space and the democratic space to intellectual class, the deintellectualization of the public discourse in India, the decline of the intelligentsia and the kind of uh, narrative which we have seen around science here. All those factors have together worked in putting fire. Kashmir, ma'am, I totally agree with the first year. Seema, would you like to intervene at this? Yeah, quick intervention, <laughs> because I actually want to listen to Fez no more. But um, I just want to say a little bit about the media, because he's, um, uh, that was one of his last points uh, initially. And, you know, you can see that play out when we over here get into this level of nationalism as the media, of macho nationalism, where we wage war and we distort news, I think Kashmir has faced the brunt of it. We've all faced it. Uh, the entire country probably has faced it, but Kashmir has faced the brunt. And you can see the play. When the stone pelting started in Kashmir, immediately the Indian media came out with the official thing that stone pelters, it's all Pakistanis. We went into Kashmir and you had initial stages, everybody coming out and saying that this was just a cry of protest. And I remember a big meeting where all the young people came out and we had, you know, politicians and we had uh, film personalities like Sayyid Mirza and others. And these guys kept coming and said, I'm a stone pelter, I'm a stone pelter, I'm a stone pelter. Meaning what they were trying to say is that we are indigenous people, don't always marry us to Pakistan. So there was that anger. Then when the floods came, the way the youth of Kashmir uh, worked day and night at risk to their lives and in places along with the army, which the army also acknowledged that yes, it is because of the young people that we were able to rescue people in the villages who were trapped, who were facing certain death. And what did we report here? Day and night, only the army rescued. The stories of heroic valor was not even touched upon, created tensions. People were upset. They felt that they're not being recognized. They feel that again, you're pushing them with, uh, you know, their back to the wall. So this has been a constant refrain. And I was discussing a little earlier that five years ago, when we went in there and thought the situation was terrible. I mean, it's a far cry. It seems normal compared to what we are facing today with the media, I'm talking about the media about the kind of channels we have come, the warmongering propaganda, the kind of people who call themselves journalists and are not journalists, they are not news channels, they are propaganda jo uh, channels. And we have been trying to work with the journalist bodies to finally, at least from within us, define what is news, what is accountability, what is transparency, what is responsibility. And then say that that is a news channel or not a news channel. Any fool opens up a channel regardless of where he comes from just because he has the money and says it's news. This is not news. Journalism is the fourth pillar of democracy. You destroy journalism, you destroy the other institutions of democracy. And that's what we are seeing. Uh, when it comes to uh, understanding Indian democracy in Kashmir, uh, the point is how 
what are those institutions, what are those symbols of democracy which a Kashmiri youngster usually relates to. So fundamentally, we, as we talked about earlier also, that when it comes to first symbol would be or the first representation would be the electoral democracy. So uh, Kashmiris have been extremely suspect of the brand of electoral democracy and the, and the representative democracy that has been uh, in work in the state for the last seven years. So they do not really, it doesn't really uh, give much confidence to Kashmiri. Then would come to the other institutions when it comes to certain federal institutions. Let's talk with media. Media would be something where uh, media is a representative of democracy. It's something which is a bulwark of democracy. But when Indian media or the national media or the TV roles, when, uh, when yesterday this uh, unfortunate incident, unfortunate, horrible incident happened in Kashmir, uh, it was firstly the TV roles which started the cries for revenge. A revenge against Kashmiris, a revenge against anybody who, who, who has a certain kind of identity. So, then revenge turned into war mongering, as you said it rightly. And this war mongering has been happening for many years now. We have been looking at surgical strikes. And if you look at the narrative in Kashmir and ask people that, what about surgical strikes? You will understand a totally different story around surgical strikes. Does it matter or not? We saw dem demonetization. And how did Indian, dem Indian media kind of portray demonetization was that it was something which crippled the stone cutters and closed their sources of income and improved the law and order situation on the ground. I have been somebody who has been dealing with law and order in Kashmir for the last 10 years. Uh, sir has been here and we understand the nuances of law and order. It doesn't really work that way. So what has been, what Indian, what, what the media channels have been essentially doing is that they have been ensuring that there is absolutely no space for reconciliation with the Indian state and the Indian democratic institutions. If the kind of India that Kashmiris get to see on their TV screens, I mean, that India doesn't really inspire confidence in anybody. Thank you. In my view, is the problem unsolved between India and Pakistan rights is independence. But from 1947, whatever 40 years they sent their people in 47 occupied, till 1975, there was comparative, this kind of thing was not there. Then luckily, Sheikh Abdullah was again heading the state. 75 to 82, it lasted seven years. When Sheikh Saab passed away, there were elections in 83. Unfortunately, at the outset, let me tell you, my reading of Kashmir is that the mess is entirely due to successive governments in Delhi. Blaming Srinagar is of no use. And when I say successive governments, we began very early. We tried to dilute the terms of accession of Kashmir to India. In 83, a peculiar thing happened. Of there was an election, assembly election of Kashmir, where National Conference was the Kashmiri dominating party and the Congress party from Delhi. They couldn't arrive at an arrangement. They fought against each other. And the National Conference won. Farooq Abdullah became the chief minister. Unfortunately, we have a thin skin. New Delhi did not like it. They thought Kashmiris have shown their thumb to do that. And that's not the way to see. It's a federal system. They have elected their own government. By a midnight coup, defections were engineered and the Kashmir government was brought down. Another government was placed. The people of, people of Kashmir, whatever they were before that, on that day, they were totally alienated. The message they got was that any election process which has been done properly, whose probity is not in doubt, if that is not respected, then you are treating Kashmir as a colony, not as a part of the Indian Union. All the problems will begin after that. As Shah Faisal rightly pointed out, the 87 elections were notorious. Kashmir felt even another nail in the coffin. And after 87, last 32 years, we have seen what's happening in Kashmir. Everybody got a share to blame. And the major part of blame is the Union government in Delhi, or whichever party. I am not, last five years what's happening doesn't even need mention. I don't even need to talk, it's self evident. But even the, the dilution of Article 370 has successfully been done by all the governments. 
right from Jawaharlal Nehru's time, Indira Gandhi's time, every government likes to extend its footprint to Kashmir. Whether the Election Commission, Supreme Court, slowly the essence of that accession has been demolished. What is the way forward? In my view, in a humble view, you must first restore that confidence. You must tell them we will abide by the terms of accession. Whatever autonomy, this word autonomy, self, I, there are terms of accession. We have agreed. This you will do, this we will do. This, we should stick to that from our point of view. Lord, nobody can go out of Kashmir. They are part of the Indian Union. But putting so much army, so much police, it only adds to the alienation. And today's youth think which people don't notice. I am talking 30 years. Most of the youth today are born after that. They don't know the past history. They don't know the glorious days of Sheikh Abdullah and the Union government. We, it is a alien, we have alienated the population completely and successfully. Now, how do you get back? I am very happy that Shah Faisal resigned from his IAS and joined trying to do his bit to bring sanity in the valley. That's, that I would say the beginning is to start restoring the process, not saying that Article 370 should be abolished and all that. All that is in the Thank you. Uh, I want your response, uh, Shah, to something. You know, something I uh, have been feeling. You know, the dominant frame in which the Kashmir issue is posed is that it is a law and order problem or a problem of insurgency. Suppose we were, or the policy makers rather, but policy makers have to respond to civil society mobilization because governments really do not follow the path of justice unless we in civil society mount pressure on them to do so. Suppose we were to see Kashmir as a political problem can, can be resolved politically through democratic means, what would be your response? Uh, I think fundamentally when we try to frame Kashmir in the nature of a law and order situation or maybe a proxy war or maybe an insurgency issue, what happens is that we are actually extricating the history of the conflict from the conflict. And what we are trying to do is that we are asking a generation of Kashmiris to kind of forget the history, the context, the geography, the culture, the memory which, is, which, which has brought us right to this situation. As uh, Mr. Muraka very rightly said that it's about those historical milestones like 1975, like 83, like 87, like 96, which are very important. And we cannot talk about the conflict by ignoring, while ignoring those important milestones. When it comes to how can we possibly connect history with this? So we have 100,000 killings have happened in the last 70 years. We have custodial disappearances of unknown number. We have an entire civilization, Kashmiri Pandits, who had to abandon their homes and who are living in exile. Their new generation doesn't understand the roots that they come from. We have a new phase of militancy happening in Kashmir. And then we tell people, let's forget all this whatever has happened in the last 70 years. Let's move on, take a package from India of 70,000 crores and forget about it and do some development and tourism and forget whatever has happened in the past and live happily thereafter. We are ignoring that it was none less than the Prime Minister of this country who has given a promise to the people of Timur Kashmir that those conditions on which accession was made, those conditions will be respected. I think those conditions need to be respected. Today, when people tell us that we are going to abolish Article 35A, people tell us we are going to abolish Article 370, what are they going to, what are they trying to convey? What kind of relationship do they envisage between the Union of India and the Jammu and Kashmir state in absence of these important articles? I think the kind of ignorance that we, which we are seeing in the rest of the country when it comes to the constitutional or the federal relationship between the Union of India and the Jammu and Kashmir state, I think that needs to be understood. And these provocations, Article 335A ko hatayenge, Article 370A ko hatayenge, when, you all, when the body is already injured, you have a hurt. The soul is in joke. And then you are adding on insults and provocations to those people. I think it's one of the most, you know, unfortunate things which has been happening. That we are trying to provoke Kashmiris into violence by raising the bogies which absolutely are not even relevant today. Thank you. Yeah.
I think that if we continue to frame Kashmir as a law and order problem, we have lost the politics of Kashmir because obviously then the trajectory is more violence, more military, more police. And if you look at the size of the population and the size of the armed forces we put in over there, security forces we have put in over there, this is going more clearly. So this muscular nationalism by which we crush all dissent and make it law order, you know, restore law and order is really the rest restoration of, shall we say, the graveyard. You get peace, but the peace of the graveyard, and that's not going to happen either. So I think this is the key problem that we face. But the problem is cannot be solved by the people of Kashmir. Unfortunately, the problem is the people of India. Unless we win this battle here, we cannot solve the problem that we are facing in Kashmir today. Kashmiris are being held hostage for a, of a toxic, to a toxic nationalism. And that's the problem we both have to fight jointly. Seema, if you'd like to come in and then I'll let Shafez have the last word before we open the <coughs> presentation. Yeah, just taking on from the last points, I think that um, we just carry an uh, army soldier, I mean, even taking it from that argument, where he's written, given his right hand, <coughs> that what does a soldier do when the government's run out of options? So if a government you know, stretches back and says that all the option, the entire option that we have is to mess around with the status of the state with the rest of India and by threatening to abolish certain statutes which determine that relationship and we are only going to treat it like a law and order problem and there is no nothing else but a law and order problem, you're creating, I mean if you do that with any state, forget Kashmir and a sensitive border state, which has so many things play, being played around with. If you do that with any state today in this country, you have a problem. You did it with uh, in uh, West Bengal. You saw it. You had Mamta out on the roads. Now, that's not a border state. That's not Kashmir. That's not dominated by the Muslims. It's not uh, interfered with by Pakistan. But federalism, autonomy, democracy, all go hand in hand. You can't mess around with it. In states like Kashmir and the Northeast, which we have seen ourselves in the 80s, the terrible, terrible violence when elections were declared there against the will of the people in Assam moving into Nelly. We've seen the terrible violence, we've seen the insurgency, we've seen how it uh, happens. So if you, if you can't have a border policy and you cannot handle your border states, you will not be able to handle the rest of India and turn India into a developed, vibrant democracy that we all come and make these rara promises with, but which have no meaning. I would conclude by saying that it will be extremely dangerous to kind of expect that we can replicate a Punjab or a Chhattisgarh or a Manipur experience in Kashmir. Kashmir is not Chhattisgarh, it's not Manipur, it's not Punjab. It's a region where three nuclear powers are this time engaged in an international conflict. And it needs to be very sensitively dealt with, number one. Number second, what can possibly be done about the situation immediately there is that I think we need to revive our humanity first. What has happened is that the Kashmir conflict has now become a, become a war between the, or it is made to be a war or a confrontation between the soldier and the stone fighter, or a cop and the stone fighter, or a cop and the militant. Fundamentally, it's the security forces which are standing in, which are, which are actually, you know, picking up the cross of the politician. It's fundamentally a problem of depoliticization, depoliticization of a space. It's about the politician withdrawing from a certain territory which belongs to him, which is then filled by the soldier and the cop and the, the counterinsurgent. I wish the politicians of this country take the responsibility and actually fill in the space that belongs to them and do not push soldiers and the cops and the police people to the borders and to those battle zones which do not belong to, which do, which do not belong to them. I wish the politician of this country actually now rises up and stops bloodshed and the people of this country hold these politicians accountable. Uh, all right, uh, we are opening up uh, one minute. Um, can we have a little patience, please? Um, I know everyone's charged and wants to ask questions. May I just 
suggest that we do not make alternative formulations. And if you could frame your frame your questions within the you know within the kind of norms that have been suggested. Talk about federalism. Talk about democracy. Uh, talk about justice and talk about solidarity with our fellow citizens. May I first, I'm going to recognize people, but please, with civility, respond. I know it's a very emotionally charged issue, but this is not what this meeting is about. We're going to have a reflective, rational debate. And I'm a teacher of long standing. I know how to maintain discipline. <laughs> um, may I first call upon uh, Vajahat Habibullah to make an observation and then we move on. And can we have gender balance, please? I'd like to see women also read. I will talk to you. Please, Vajahat, sir. Uh, Mike? Uh, yes, please. We have a mic. Mike? Yeah, here's the mic. Just go there. that uh, after I entered the service in 1968, I have served, I've had, this, I have had the opportunity to serve in Jammu and Kashmir, but also deeply ashamed of the fact that my service in Jammu and Kashmir has been a complete failure. Uh, proud why? Here you have this young man. Uh, you wouldn't find educated young people like oh. that when I actually joined the state. Now you have plenty of young people, bright young people like this, who are able to speak to you in the way Shah Faisal has. Ashamed because a mission for me in Kashmir was that I might win over the youth to the idea of India. And I committed myself and dedicated myself fully while working there and while working in the Prime Minister's office. I was in the Prime Minister's office under Mrs. Gandhi in 1987 too. Uh, to making them feel that they are Indians. The description you have heard shows you what has been the consequence. Certainly a cause of personal shame to me. But if I may just summarize from the discussion the issues that have emerged, and you would all have heard of the question of Azadi, 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 being the theme of stone pelters and others. Unfortunately, I have to admit standing here before you and Dr. Chandok that Kashmir has never enjoyed democracy. Not in 1953, not even in 1950, when Sheikh Abdullah faced election himself as leader of the National Congress. You know that. After, I mean, for a long time, people have talked about 1977 being very free and fair elections. I was Deputy Commissioner of Srinagar and conducted those elections. They were freer than the elections before them. But when I was, when I was presiding officer of an electoral booth in Anantnag in 1971, as we walked out with the ballot boxes to put in the treasury before the counting the next day, the polling officer who was with me, walking with me, and he actually carrying the boxes, said, char, char din ki chandani, paanch saal ka adhera. Because those ballot boxes, what was contained in them, were not the election result. Uh, the rigging of elections had been made into a fine art from the very time of the initiation. Now, in 1977, I would admit that the elections were not entirely rigged, but they were not what might, one might call fully free and fair either. 1983, the elections were much larger, and of course, I was associated uh, with the decisions and elections and things that took place rather, but 77 gave a glimmer that there could be, there were possibilities of democracy in Kashmir. And that, unfortunately, we know did not lead to what they felt would be a democracy. And there have been 
I would admit, since 2002, at least there have been free and fair elections there. But then how, what is the, what is the breadth of participation? Has everybody actually participated in those elections? So, basically, on the question of accession, the accession took place because the Kashmiri people were convinced, on the persuasion of their leader, Sheikh Abdullah, that freedom could be had only in India. And he's described this several times. That freedom they have not enjoyed. I have called my book The Dying of the Light because the light that has died there, this was a totally non-violent people. <coughs> totally. So non-violent that when I actually arrived in the state, they couldn't slaughter a kitchen in their home they had to, had to engage a butcher to come and slaughter the chicken for them. And this is the state where young people are now associated with violence. What have we done? Thank you. Uh, you know, I'd like to accommodate as many questions as possible. The last 10 minutes I want to give to Shafel. So please make your questions sharp and short pointed. Uh, I'm going to ask, the mic will come to you, this young woman, uh, lady to mic. I. Short and sharp, please. Yeah, uh, good, uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, it was of course very enlightening hearing this panel. Uh, sir, like you talked about the both sides of the uh, story very pragmatically, and uh, but I would like to be precise to only one side because being a Kashmiri, I think first of all I can take responsibility of my behavior. Now, my question is, don't you think Kashmiri youth is becoming victim of emotional or moral ignorance, thus being misled because of their lack of facts and, and isolation from basic knowledge? So, don't you feel, feel it is the inefficiency of our education system for not being able to educate the youth about the basic facts, about the ground situation, about the real story, about the past, about the history, history of accession, what we are talking about. I mean, we can talk about this institution of democracy only when the people at ground level are aware about its importance. Yeah. Thank you. We can you. be talking about it then only. I think you've made your point. Very good point. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Yeah. I just want, was wondering whether this uh, gathering can give, itself, can give itself at least one little task and attempt even if it fails. Can we negotiate with two what I would call criminal channels, Republic and News? <laughs> news, uh, I mean, news. Yeah, and I negotiate I with them and, and, ask them, yeah, uh, and negotiate with them and ask them to stop the damn war. Yeah. Can we do it? Yeah. Uh, yes, um, Manishankar Ayur, would you like to intervene? Uh, Mike, please. I'll call upon, everybody will have a chance. I just want to say it's a great privilege to meet a wonderful Indian called Shah Faisal. Thank you. Uh, how do I go? Okay, gender balance. Yes, please. And then all, everybody will. You will get a chance. Ji, I am from the wire Urdu, so my question will be in Urdu. I will ask you if you are in Urdu, if you are in Urdu, then give me a chance. My question is that now you have been in the political society, so you have been in the political society. My question is that this is a little out of the box, if I may say so myself, कि क्या ये मुमकिन है कि पांच साल बाद, दस साल बाद, इंशाल्लाह पंद्रह, बीस साल बाद भी हम एक मुतहिद जुमुरी जुनूबी एशिया, a sort of federal South Asia, जिसमें जो सरहदें हैं वो धुंधली पड़ जाएं, बेमानी तो नहीं, बेमानी हो जाएं एक तरह से क्योंकि हट तो नहीं सकती, आप तारीख को बदल तो नहीं सकते, सरहदें हट तो नहीं सकती, ल جنوبی ایشیا سوٹر فیڈرل ساؤت ایشیا کا تصور کر سکتے ہیں اور جو آپ کا رابطہ رہتا ہے اپنے عوام سے آپ جڑے ہوئے قریبی طور سے اپنے لوگوں سے کیا یہ کشمیری عوام کو قابل قبول ہوگا 
Thank you. Uh, I don't want to burden this young man too much. So, uh, yeah, short and sharp, please. Hi, my name is Shahan Mazdoul. I'm from Kashmir. My question is to Shah Faisal. So, uh, he knows Kashmir. I know Kashmir. Everybody knows here. Kashmir. But my Put question, your mic up. Yeah. yeah, my question uh, to Shah Faisal is, what would be your role in such a terrible situation? This is my simple question to Shah Faisal. What would be your role? Uh, as far as political settlement is concerned. When I say political settlement, it's about dialogue, negotiation is all that. Thank you. To the, uh, now I'll start from here. Yes? Yes? Could you introduce yourself? Yeah. I'm Ram. I'm coming from Hyderabad. I visited Kashmir and Ladakh and other places several times. I have a very external point of view. I'm not very well informed. What is your question? Yeah. My question is, uh, I was following Andhra Telangana division. Uh, initially, I was not supporting. I thought that is unfair. But I visited Kashmir, looking at people there, I thought that kind of emotional burden on people to live together is very unfair. Yeah. Since then, I started supporting division of Telangana, though I belong to Andhra. Please, can you ask your yeah. question? The question we is... Discuss Telangana on another day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was just relating to the issue. Oh, okay, sorry for the yeah, <coughs> diversion. I was wondering, why should uh, Kashmir be part of India with so much of emotional burden and so much of violence. If they want to live independently, you know, together with India, we, there are several countries, yeah. why not we allow? I think Indians are unnecessarily putting Thank burden you. on... Uh, Thank Kashmir. you. In the middle, yes. Sorry, uh, to, yes. Uh, uh, well, how nice. Give her a mic. Must Hello, be the youngest evening. member of our audience. Hello, good evening. I have a question to Dr. Shah Faisal. I'm from Kashmir. I have been, uh, the, I have been in Delhi. तो फ्रॉम लास्ट थ्री मंथ्स जो स्कूल मुझे यहाँ पे मिला दिल्ली में बैठ के इन तीन मंथ्स में आई एम ओनली अलेवन इयर्स ओल्ड जो स्कूल मुझे यहाँ पे मिला दिल्ली में बैठ के वो स्कूल मुझे कश्मीर में नहीं मिलता क्यों क्योंकि वहाँ वहाँ के हालात ऐसे हैं कि अगर हम यहाँ की बात करें तो हमें भी पढ़ना है मैं मैं अपने मैं अपने फ्यूचर को आगे ले ले जाना चाहती हूँ मैं अपने माँ बाप का नाम रोशन करना चाहती हूँ तो इसलिए कि यहाँ के यहाँ का जो बच्चा आपका एजुकेशन के बारे में सवाल है ना जी बताइए जो यहाँ के स्कूल्स हैं वो इन तीन महीनों मंथ में मैंने देखा कि यहाँ के स्कूल्स कंटिन्यूस खुले होते हैं जब अगर आप कश्मीर की बात करें तो कश्मीर में ना हफ्ते में दो बार स्कूल खुला होता है बाकी तीन दिन बंद होते हैं क्यों इसकी वजह यह है कि क्योंकि वहाँ पे स्ट्राइक्स होते हैं जब हम बाहर जाते हैं इधर भी ड्राफ्ट में देखें कि आर्मी आर्मी मैन होता है खड़ा इधर देखें तो सोल्जर होता है खड़ा ऐसे दे, देखते हैं तो होते हैं वो खड़ा ऐसे हम डर जाते हैं हमें जैसा खौफ हमने जैसा खौफ बढ़ गया है कि हम कैसे जा पाएंगे अब स्कूल यहाँ पे तो मैंने देखा कि बारह एक दो बजे तक लोग वहाँ से मतलब ऑफिस से वापस आ जाते हैं उनका कोई डर नहीं है थैंक यू बच्चा हमें आपका सवाल और आपकी एंजाइटी समझ आ गई है वेरी गुड बहुत अच्छा सवाल है नो लेटर यू ऑलरेडी बीना अभी 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 आती हूँ सब क्यों मिलेगा शाह फैज़ल दिस इज़ फॉर यू बेटा नाउ आई कॉम्प्लीमेंट यू डालिंग आई रनिंग ए स्कूल आई रनिंग ए स्कूल इन सी And that school has been there. That our family has been there since 1896, four generations, and we are touch wood very, very happy there. Of course, things do happen, and, but uh, people are still very, very nice to us, and we have no, no, absolutely no problems. But she is very right now. Shah, what I would suggest to you is that people like uh, Bitter, but the children like you, the boys like you, can only start this movement, not the movement of only Azadi and things like that. I mean, we just. You know, not no government will do anything. I don't think anybody would, because you uh, you belong to that place and you understand their feelings and you you are the person who can start this with other educated you know youth. And I'm sure everybody will listen to you. I'm sure everybody will. I'm sure you can play the biggest role. I feel, and yeah. of course, the intellectual intellect. Thank you, Vina. Is I say I yes, this yeah. gentleman. Would yeah, but I yeah. Up. अभी आपको आपकी I'm going section by section जी हाय my question is to connect it to larger large larger point of rising populism throughout the world so the people who are vying for blood and war in India 
are Indian citizens. Instead of lecturing them or just looking down upon them, how do we engage them? Because we are not only alienating Kashmiris, but one of the responsibilities we are alienating yeah. rest of Indians. Thank so how do we reach out? Thank you. Uh, would you like to take it up and talk? Yeah, let him answer. I would answer. Next to you. So one question was about: uh, Do Kashmiri youth have a sense of history, and what kind of education do we need to give to them? My belief is that. Kashmiri youngsters are over-educated. They have a completely amazing sense of history and sense of education when it comes to their past, when it comes to their political rights. Uh, somebody who is doing a PhD or has done a doctorate somewhere, has done an MBBS, I do not think somebody like me can go and educate him about his political rights. It's fundamentally about the consciousness of those political rights which is becoming a problem in Kashmir today. And I think unless we restore those rights, that problem is going to be there. Uh, one was, you uh, asked a very good question about South Asia, how can we unite South Asia? I think Kashmir can uh, be a South Asia for South Asia. We have the concept of the Silk Route, which is our concept of Kashmir, which is our location of Ladakh and Jammu. Uh, some of the things that have been done before, like some of the roads have also been opened by Silk Route, which we can be able to do. Now, we have a lot of talk about the Kargil Skardu Route, which can connect Kashmir and Dilgit and other areas with other areas. Kashmir could actually become a pivot and a connecting point between various civilizations, various cultures, or जो शायद एक larger South Asia के ये जो larger जो हमारा जो equation है उसको बना सकता था। I wish दोनों countries के जो leaders हैं वो realize करें कि जो Silk Route का जो हमारा culture है, जो हमारी तहजीब है, उसको अगर हम revive कर सकें, तो एक बड़ा जबरदस्त एक initiative हो सकता है South Asia की unification के के लिए। When it comes to role and political settlement, मेरा क्या role है? I believe that uh, which I have been constantly saying is that we need to humanize the narrative around Kashmir and the rest of the country. And my job is to go to the people of India. It's not the politicians of India or maybe the MLAs or the ministers of India who are going to finally grant solutions for Kashmir problem. My belief is that unless Indians are convinced, 1.2 billion Indians, unless they are convinced that we need a solution in Kashmir, we need to humanize that space, solutions are not going to come in. And I want to go out and talk to as many people, and I'm sure that uh, this life is going to be sh uh, so not going to be enough for that. But I can at least make my effort. Uh, uh, you asked a question. I think you got your answer with the applause at the back. Uh, uh, that that small girl asked a very important question about militarized social spaces in Kashmir. Uh, this is a very serious concern for youngsters there that the social space has been militarized, and. Uh, the youngsters do not have the freedom to move. For this young girl, aspiration of freedom or the idea of freedom possibly would be Delhi. She wants to have a life the way people in Delhi live. I wish we could somehow restore those uh, spaces to people and demilitarization from civilian areas is that's why one of the very important steps towards restoration of confidence of the civilian population uh, and that would really help us, in, help us in bringing normalcy to people and making their lives a bit better. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a minute. Uh, Zoya Farida Puchipani? No? Farida? Mike DJ on professional. Okay. Now I took this side, Subichki side. Baby, I'm coming. Oh, Sir, please, up. But then. Very good evening to all of you. I'm Muzaffar Shah. Senior Vice President of Jammu Kashmir Awami National Conference. And at present, spearheading the uh, 35A uh, campaign that is going on in the Supreme Court. Uh, I've heard a lot of uh, questions, and the distinguishing panel that is here talked about Kashmir. Subject is way forward. So I would here like to ask all of you together today. Because we talked about yesterday's, uh, the carnage that took place in the valley, wherein we lost so many lives. And every single Kashmiri is very, very heartbroken and sad about it. But today, while we are talking here, I would like to tell the panel also here, and my friends, ladies, all my youngsters here, that we have had a very, very disturbing news coming out of Jammu while we are sitting here. 
more than 100 odd vehicles have been torched by now and so many houses have been attacked and the governor's administration it could have clamped curfew since yesterday evening as a precautionary measure what i would suggest that we would be listening to all our distinguished all the all the people on the podium we'll be listening to so many questions here so many answers but i would suggest as a way forward a simple uh, suggestion if it would be agreed upon how many of you present here or on the dais are ready tomorrow to walk from jantar mantar to the parliament and say hey stop this in jammu stop this in kashmir are you ready no. then please do that let the cpa make this announcement and let us all go and walk for jammu and kashmir walk for this country walk for humanity please do that thank you very much okay now despite my deep desire to accommodate every question i'm afraid we won't be able to do it we just have about 50 like can i make a suggestion please write your names on a small piece of paper and i'll ask each member of the panel to draw a lot sorry but kabhi kabhi kismat ke faisle manzoor rehne chahiye aur kaagaz de dijiye sab naam denge in the meantime sukumar would you like to say something no uh aap apne naam dijiye we'll we'll just draw yeah yes nina please that just as our problem in india has been the partition of the country do you recognize that kashmir is partition does that play a role in the five points that you put before us with which i agree completely thank you santosh yeah please mike uh, i'm vijay naik i'm a journalist i just want to have views of mr faisal on two points actually uh we have been reporting kashmir for a long time we have seen uh, rajesh pilot george fernandes and many others being sent from here to talk to every stakeholder in kashmir they have talked to these people then uh, they come back they we have got, got to mr the, you know uh, delhi parliamentary committee going there and discussing all these things to see now we have seen this safe passage also policy of this center but what has gone wrong on these particular things as kamal said it is the center which was responsible for these things and secondly what do you have to see of silencing the center voice of the media like shujaat bukhari in jammu and kashmir these two points i would like to have from you the views yeah okay have you written your names now i'm afraid i'm not going to be able to accommodate no i think you at random okay please aap bolie the gentleman in yes yes you yes you yeah You know, there's so many names. Oh, yeah. I have a short question. I want uh, I want the panel to uh, ponder upon what would be the role of the Kashmiri civil society. What can they do? Just have a civil society. That's more than enough. <laughs> yes, yes. Ah, bolie the gentleman in the yeah, young man in the blue striped T-shirt. I'm sorry if I'm being arbitrary, but I have no choice. Yeah. Uh, actually, I was recently in a debate show. uh i asked the question that uh, your uh, the, the debate show was about the eradicating the article 370 so um, uh, the panelist told that um, i asked him question that uh, this is a great provision you have provided to the jammu and kashmir but uh, in spite of this provision there is a lot of unrest in the state uh, so you know you are talking about eradicating don't you think that there will be more unrest and uh, he replied the, the answer was that uh, by eradicating this we are um, we are um, uh, making 93% of the indian population happy uh, and so what is your question and the question is yes i am coming to that and the question is uh, that is this the healthy way is this the healthy approach for the way forward and is this what we are what showing to the kashmiri that you belong to us yes at the back yes in the black t-shirt bolie ji aap my kind uh sir today more than development more than employment uh, a kashmiri wants his political aspirations to be fulfilled sir what is your vision for the same because all the kashmiris want is not jobs though there is element of joblessness in kashmir we see there have been a lack of development 
but more than that he feels alienated from the mainstream so what's your vision for the to in uh, to bring uh, kashmiri youth into the mainstream you know i'm so happy to have all these questions on education and jobs being raised i really congratulate all the young people here it's a very healthy development in our political discourse not a single mention of the cow thank you uh, yes this young woman yeah yeah uh, no, yeah at the back i'll call upon you later yes you have to be now fair to me and ask a short yes. sharp question uh, so recently we saw the central government taking initiatives like taking uh, groups of kashmiri students to all india tour so that they feel inclusive and they feel that they are a part of the country so do you feel that such actions on the part of the central government are helpful do we need mighty earth shattering shattering actions or we need baby steps as a way forward yeah. on the part of the central government thank you yes uh, mr uh, fazal sir if you could answer this yeah question. Uh, at, yes, yeah, the gentleman who raised his hand. Puchi. Hmm. Then I'm coming. Going to come this side because it's been ignored. Yeah. Short and simple, sir. Uh, you mentioned the polarization between the centre and the state. I'd like you to touch upon the polarization also within the state. The difference in aspirations of the difference between the people of Jammu and the people of Kashmir. If you could touch upon that as well. Thank you. Yes. I'm going to allow three questions more because there's a very big list that I think the panel will have to respond no. to. You can't expect only him. Yes. Yeah. Everybody has been there. Meet uh, foreign affairs expert or defence expert or whosoever is there. There has been solution in everybody's mind, but they say that it's not going to be done in near future. What's 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 the, what's what's the hurdle? Why it's not being done? All the, all the experts that uh, who have been working for Kashmir for the last thirty years. They know Siva must find some sort of a solution. Uh, every, everybody knows. Bajaj sir knows. Manishan Karayir sir knows. All, all the people know. They have been working for quite quite a long time. We've got your question. So thank you. What's the yes. What, what what we can do about? There have been a lot of. Yes. Thank you. We've got yes, a young lady here. <laughs> Hello, sir. I'm really happy to see that the Kashmiris are coming forward, leaving I'm their so bureaucracy yeah. and. Uh, going to the new political system but uh, my question is about that don't you think we need to get to the root level of where from radicalization has started it's not only about the countries it's not about india it's not about pakistan i don't want to give it a islamization phase but we need to see how in kashmir we are going from sufi to salafi thought we need to get the radical very good question. very good question. thank you yes somebody from this section Koi, yes, please at the back. Next is your section. Who gave? Good evening, Abhinav. Uh, my question to uh, my question is uh, to Shafiq sir. Mm -hmm. Sir, I want to uh, know what's you, uh, what's your way of going forward. Uh, you uh, we have uh, you want you said you want to do it in a, in a uh, political way, but we have uh, one of the law in national in national assembly saying that it is beyond my jurisdiction. So what's your way of forward? Okay. Thank you. Yes, from here I'm going to give each section a chance. Yes, from this side. Yes. Uh, sorry, lack of the draw. Yes. Aisha. Uh, right, your question. So, Give it to him. Yeah. Reply. So you yeah. know, a lot of criticism has been of the centre that the centre doesn't coordinate. And since you have chosen political life, uh, how do you think you would be different than what we have seen yet from coming from Kashmir? Thank you. This section. Yes. At the yes, the gentleman, the young man in the blue shirt. Yes. Puchi, jaldi. Uh, hello, uh, uh, I'm Shahzad. So actually, I'm from Assam. I'm, I'm very happy that Seema Ma'am mentioned about the Nelly message. Shri Hamza, very good question. Thank so you. So my question is that a dialogue can be a very uh, good solution. So yeah. the question is, uh, should it be a bilateral dialogue or uh, should it be a trilateral dialogue? Okay. Chaliye, yes, watch the ask. Ma'am, ma one question. Ma yes, the last question from this side. I'll ask you. Would you? We have established that media, national media and the newsrooms are not very good in the country. But how do we change that? How we have seen it? that channels like The Wire are coming up, which are not taking funding from many of the organizations, but are run on public funding. But we have also seen the kind of approach the channels have. So how do we change the media scenario of the country to change the larger political Thank system? you. I think a lot of media is doing so. You have one responsible question. journalists here. 
Yes, said the gentleman in the, you and the boy in the back, yes. I have to describe you by your parents. Hello, sir. My question is to Shafir, sir. sir. Quickly. As a politician, sir, how would you restore my faith in the Indian democracy when even in 2019, my governor announces the name of the mayor even before two weeks before the actual results? How would you restore my faith in the Indian democracy? Last question. Uh, yes, that young woman and then the young man in the white sweatshirt. Yes. You'll have to take off your mask. Hi, my question is how and where do you envision Kashmiri women in your way forward? Yes. Yeah. And you? Yes. Uh, do you think the question of enlarging the democratic space requires as a condition that we incorporate the question of Azadi within the ambit of discussion? Very good question. Uh, you know, if you're... Huh? Yes. I mean, I was going to say, if you're going to enter public life, you've got ah. your agenda. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's unfair to expect him to answer every question. So I would request members of the panel to pitch in, if when they can. And just regulating time. Thank you. I'll yeah. be very brief with uh, some of the questions which I think sum up the problem in Kashmir. One would be... Uh, uh, what happened to those reports and why we always have these interlocutors and the negotiators and the arbitrators coming to Kashmir and nothing happens in Delhi. Because for every large report created in Kashmir, there's a large dustbin in which it's put later on. Uh, that dustbin, I mean, we have not been able to kind of figure out how we can possibly reclaim these, uh, these uh, reports from that and get something going in Kashmir. I think the day there is a sincere political outreach and an initiative from, the de from, the, from Delhi, we'll see definitely some movement happening in Kashmir. Uh, till then, all these, uh, in fact, what has happened over a period of last 30 years is that we have discredited the institution of dialogue. The last uh, couple of years back, when a group of parliamentarians tried to visit uh, uh, the separatists in Kashmir, they were snubbed because over a period of last 30 years, we have made this institution, these reach outs, very meaningless. I think we need to bring back uh, credibility to those institutions of dialogue and reach out if we want some movement to, ha to happen in, in near future. Uh, what about what about the fulfillment of aspirations? I, I, I will be clubbing these two questions that uh, what in, in this democratic discourse which we are talking about, uh, is there a space for talking about things which are like taboo words? <laughs> so I think uh, I have been consistently saying that when it comes to enlarging the de democratic space, we need to also allow those taboo words to be discussed. Uh, when it comes to, if people talk about RSD in Kashmir, what do you do? I mean, you better listen to those people, listen to those voices, because uh, as I said earlier also, that we need to enlarge the idea of sedition, the, the idea of uh, freedom of speech when it comes to talking about Kashmir, if, if you really want to listen to, the, to, to all the voices in Kashmir. Uh, uh, what about the inclusive tours uh, that, that are being taken? I think one of the, one of the unfortunate failures of the state has been the failure of Sadbalna program, which has happened in the last 30 years. It was a program intended to take uh, Kashmiri youngsters and show them the rest of the country. But the way it was done, it was done in the nature of perception management. It was done in the nature of a psyops. And psyops is something which people easily understand. And, and the fundamental failure, the cause of failure of the Sadhavna program was that it was presented to people in the nature of a psychological warfare and people rejected it. And that was one of the unfortunate ways in which we lost one more battle in Kashmir. Uh, uh, what about the aspirations of Jammu and, and Ladakh and other regions? I think the, uh, one of the major problems in Kashmir today is that how we can possibly converge the aspirations of other two regions. That's why the maintaining the territorial integrity of the state becomes even more important today than, than it was before. And the attempt is to divide the state into multiple regions that, uh, that are being uh, this time resisted. Uh, what was the root cause of conflict about radicalization? Uh, if you look at the available literature around radicalization, you will see that uh, you know, movement towards religion happens more in, in, in places where there is an element of despair, where there is an element of hopelessness, where there is conflict. Uh, I believe that radicalization is a consequence of conflict, not the cause of conflict. And this is, I have solid research to prove that religious radicalization, to whatever extent happens in conflict zones, that's a consequence, not a cause. Uh, uh, why doesn't center take 
why doesn't center take any initiative? Uh, I, that's my question as well, that the owners, to, people tell me, why don't you tell Pakistan to take an initiative? This is not my job to take, tell Pakistan to do whatever they want to do. My Mullah Ki Dor Masjid, I can tell Delhi and impress upon them to take an initiative. Our job is to tell Delhi to come forward and do something about Kashmir. Uh, should the di dialogue be, di uh, what should be the nature of the dialogue? Uh, people tell us that should certain people in Kashmir be talked to? I believe that everybody should be talked to if you want to solve the problem. And dialogue does, doesn't have to be trilateral only, it will have to be a multilateral dialogue to bring in all the voices on the table. Uh, about uh, change and how to create alternative media, ma'am, I would want you to answer that question. Uh, how to restore faith in Indian democracy? Uh, it's really a big task for me as well because people tell me that the kind of experiments which have happened in the past, those experiments have failed and you are going to fail as well. There is absolutely no reason to trust the democratic institutions of this country. But uh, my belief is that we need to give, uh, we need to give one more chance to ourselves. Whatever has not worked in the past, we need to make it work because we do not have any alternatives other than engaging democratically with the, with the rest of the country. Uh, last, uh, last one question about, uh, about the role of Kashmiri women. I think that's one of the most important themes which I am working on because Kashmiri women are basically the, the worst sufferers of conflict. It's finally the mother and the daughter and the sister who has suffered really in the last 30 years. I wish we can restore the political agency of the Kashmiri women and my task will be to, to ensure that when we talk about democratic, democratic participation, we can possibly restore the agency to the Kashmiri women and reserve their spaces and, and ensure that they get their due as well in the democratic space. I think that basically sums up uh, most of the questions. Thank you. On the media. Thank you. On the media. We have enough uh, answers on what the media. What do we do with the toxic uh, uh, I wish we had an answer to what we can do because the reach of the non-funded media is nothing as compared to the reach of the funded media. And uh, this is what we've been saying it for years, it's like, you know, you're standing and you keep on saying the same thing over and over again, and journalists ourselves, we don't listen to each other, that when the appearance of television came in, and television came in with the money bags, and the corporates came in, and they controlled the editors, they controlled the working journalists, I still remember that we had 14 parties, political parties, um, coming together after uh, intervention by CPA, many interventions by CPA at the boat club, uh, at the um, uh, Constitution Club Lawns. And it was the first time that 14 political parties said that AFSPA should be abolished and we should get rid of it. I thought it was, you know, it's a headline call, all the major parties. Entire media was there, one phone call, and this is not five, four years ago, this was about seven, eight years ago, so you can figure out who was in government then. One phone call and that was it, it was blacked out news on Kashmir was completely not a line appeared. And they were all there, all friends, colleagues, because it was an important coming together. So the thing is that there is this uh, discrepancy, I, I mean this kind of uh, discrimination, uh, tremendous discrimination. And um, we don't have an answer. You know, the digital space is available to us today. The funding has already started coming into the digital space. You have various people who you think are independent are probably getting funding from various sources. Uh, who have come years ago, and um, uh, so, uh, but they know that on the digital social media space, you need to have some criticism while you go along with some of the mainstream part, uh, stories. So you can see that manipulation already happening. And they haven't come full-time because full-time advertisements have not yet come into the digital, digital space, but I can see already the destruction beginning. What's the answer? I don't know. The two answers may be, one, we have start cooperatives, funded by journalists and by people like you. And two, all of you start paying for the news instead of looking for free news. That's a killer because when you read free news, then the one rupee of Times of India giving you this much raddi, which the housewife then can sell for two rupees, completely destroys us. Because they can give you news at no price. But news gathering requires price. How do we do it? It's something that we have to take a collective decision. Otherwise, what's happening in um, uh, Kashmir will continue and what's happening in the rest of India will continue. Thank you. Uh, Prabir, last 
uh, coming? Yeah, I just have two sh very short comments. One is, I think the issue is not the answers in Kashmir. The issue is the kind of questions we raise. And I'm very happy Shah Fazil is raising those kind of questions. The second is about the media. We really need to understand the media that is coming in, including the digital media. And I think as CPA, we should take, make an attempt to also organize some discussions in media. It cannot be done in the form. Yes. Uh, before I thank my panelists and Shah Faisal in particular, I'd like to thank the audience. You have been wonderful. It's been a very, very productive session. And a big clap for such, such charged young people. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. One second. Another time. One yeah. minute, one minute. I just want to thank the chair for being so wonderful. And I also want to thank uh, Shah Faisal. We were on tenterhooks and I think it shows his character and his courage that he came despite the tensions and, you know, the tightrope walking that he thought he would do. And he had that character to come down to Delhi as promised and then ask us to do something else rather than just the lecture. I really admire you for that. I would ask Mr. Maratha to give Shah Faisal a little token of books. CPA only believes in books, not in money, unfortunately. And um, uh, Prabir, another trustee of ours, to Neera Chando. Thank you so much, everyone, for being so good and a wonderful audience. Thank you.